Yes, we are on. This is Jack Napier, Red Pill Reads, together with Carl from Black Label Logic. And we are talking about Building Value, his latest book. Carl, thank you very much for doing this. Oh, it's my pleasure. And thank you for doing the recording of um, Gendernomics for the uh, audiobook. My pleasure, my pleasure. It really was. It helped me out with a lot of things, not just sexual market value and things like that, but also economic principles that I never knew of, actually. So it taught me more than economics in school ever did. Well, that was kind of what I had in mind for it, because I figured by using that analogy, I would automatically be teaching guys about uh, economics. And I think having a sound uh, understanding of economics is important to enable you to live the life you want. True. Not a, not a bad point. But what specifically um, about the sexual marketplace and economics made you want to write about all of this? I mean, Gendernomics 1 is a pretty thick read. You put a lot of effort into it, but where's the where's the why in it? Why I wanted to write it? or uh... yeah. yeah, because you're the only one who delved so deep into the material about sexual marketplace. Well, I just thought when I heard that analogy of the sexual marketplace for the first time, I just started looking around and I kept seeing, you know, okay, this is a confirmation of this economic principle because economics at the core is just about how you utilize and distribute resources. And then you can go as deep, deep as you want with it. But once you're um, in that view of things, then it becomes obvious that people are just resources. And when you're trying to get laid or you're trying to find a partner, what you're doing is you're going out into a market and you're looking for a specific solution for your problem. Mm -hmm. And what you value there is going to be dependent on what you're looking for. So it makes um, perfect sense to use economics. Like there's a supply and demand, for instance, which is kind of a central principle in genderonomics. And um, the issue there being the supply and demand differential between men and women, because in theory, we have about 50-50 uh, gender distribution. It's 51-49 in favor of women, mm -hmm. uh, according to the CIA fact book. But everyone is always trying to get a better deal than, like everyone dates aspirationally. So you have a bunch of people at the bottom there that are kind of being left behind. And you have people at the top that are in very high demand. And that kind of shapes the way the market works because the people at the top, they have a lot of um, opportunities to make choices and make better choices, whereas the ones at the bottom don't really have any uh, opportunity to be discerning. They just kind of have to take what they can get. Mm -hmm. That's why you can see good looking guys dating, well, for lack of a better term, fat chicks and things like that and the other way around. Well, you'll occasionally see something like that, and a lot of the time, you know, you'll see a guy date a girl who's maybe a little less good looking than he is. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of those, it's become because of value added. Because once you have to deal with a girl on a long term basis, there are other um, choice criteria that influence your selection than just her looks. If you're just trying to have a one night stand or something, then it becomes. Um, you're just looking for someone who kind of hits those triggers for you. But if you're going to be with someone for five, maybe 10 years, then you're going to have to look into other criteria. Like, can I stand to be around this person? That's a big one. Like I once had the, uh, I don't know, I'm not really speaking for everybody else, but just, I think that most guys prefer a blonde with big tits and a nice ass. I think, but I once had one fake tits, like, by God, biggest fucking tits I've ever held. But after the second lay, when she opened her mouth, I just couldn't stand her. I was finding reasons to kick her out. And that really made me realize that no matter how good she looks, if you can't stand her, you, she's worthless. She's absolutely worthless. She may have a 10 in looks, but her personality brings everything down to a five. And... I had a discussion with a friend of mine who said, Jack, the only thing you want is a virgin who fucks like a whore. But my counter argument was, I don't want the virgin who's a whore. I just want a girl who's enthusiastic 
that makes the 10. Not necessarily her looks. I mean, her looks have to be a seven or above for me to find her attractive. But if her character, her way you're speaking just annoys me, it's done. She's down five points. Well, I think that can be a major factor, and that's kind of where you have to draw the line because you have girls who are one night stands, you have plates, you have uh, LTR girls or whatever, and you kind of have to figure out what category is a given girl in because you have a lot of good girls that are uh, are great. Um, what's it called? Um, great one night stands, but you don't want to be around them for too long, and then you have girls who are maybe mediocre as one night stands, but are great in like a longer term context. So it's just depends on what you're looking for. You Like they have the old expression, you can't turn a hoe into a housewife. Mm -hmm. And it's a kind of a similar thing. If a girl is only into her looks and only into her body, if that's her only selling point and there's nothing else you like about her, you're going to have an issue uh, being around her in the long term. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever tried that on Tinder? These girls that put foodie or I love food in their description and you just ask them, but can you cook? how they just go mental. Yeah, I never did that, but I imagine that wouldn't go very well because a lot of the times with um, with girls, it's like, it's very basic. And every girl is like, I'm, I'm unique. So I love pizza, wine and traveling. And so does every other girl on Tinder. <laughs> True. But she's special because she's inked and pierced. Mm. Well, I, don't, I can I, deal with a little bit of tattoos and a little bit of, um, piercings but there's a limit to how much what would be too much for you uh, it depends kind of on the girl but uh i tend to say that you know a tattoo on the tits is like putting a bumper sticker on a lambo true but what about in between the tits not a big fan of tattooing that area in general <laughs> it spoils the view well i think it's just the same thing with anyone it's with tattoos and piercings, like I recommend that guys who kind of have that extremely nerdy look, getting a couple of tattoos that will help with, uh, you know, bad boying you a bit up. Mm -hmm. But uh, don't go too far with it because you don't want to get like a full Japanese, uh, full body tattoo or something like that because you still have to uh, consider that you need to work. Like a face tat is a great way of saying, uh, you know, I'm a bad boy, but it's also a great way of saying I never want to work a proper job ever again. No, that's capitalism's fault. Capitalism made these people not have a job. Nothing to do with the tattoo. Yeah, we're all uh, big haters of capitalism here. Yeah, me too. No, I was just kidding. You see, like Aaron Clary made that point a lot. Like these guys with tattoos all over. I can't find a job. It's capitalism's fault. Fucking morons. Well, it, it's like the whole thing with, uh, you know, you can actually drive your value down in the sexual marketplace quite easily. And in any other marketplace, like finding a job is about having a set of skills that someone is willing to pay you money to use. And it's the same thing with um, finding a partner. It's about having those traits that someone finds attractive mm -hmm. and, and you traits that other people value rather than traits... Uh, that you just have by default true and you just mentioned the very fair point that it all depends on what you want and that's what i liked about gendernomics one a lot is that you described very well that the sexual marketplace in general isn't really a thing but that the sexual marketplace is divided in very multiple marketplaces so your sexual marketplace is very subjective to the things you want. That really was an eye opener to me because I kind of held on to the thing that the 10 is a 10 in general. But as you just mentioned, it's, every, it's actually very subjective. It depends on what I want. I mean, you may like blondes, I may like brunettes, vice versa. Big tits, small tits, big hips, small hips, things like that. So that really was something I think most guys can have a great message to that they don't need to have the Instagram model to have a 10. Their 10 will be a four to anybody else. It's what they want. I think that's maybe a bit, a little bit too hard on it. I think to some extent it's subjective in that 
uh, if you ask 10,000 guys to rate a woman, mm -hmm. you, the little large numbers will kick in and she'll hit kind of a median rating where, you know, some guys will say she's a seven, some will say six, some might say five, but you're not going to have like, no, she's obviously a 10 or a one because mm -hmm. you're not going to have that big of a disparity because there, there are biological factors at play that make us like certain things like waist to hip ratios, clear skin, long hair, et cetera, signs of fertility and vitality. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there are smaller mar niche marketplaces within the sexual marketplace. It's very easy to think of it as a monolith, but it's much more like a stock market. You have a ton of different companies being traded on the stock market and their value goes up and down depending on, uh, a lot of different fundamental factors, but there are also trends and um, that type of thing in place. So, you know, a girl, if a girl is a nine in one place, she'll probably be a seven, eight or a nine anywhere else. But uh, if you take one of these, um, take Orlando or Miami or New York or Hollywood, those are places where extremely hot girls congregate. So a 10 in Hollywood is probably gonna break the uh, chart in bumfuck Idaho, <laughs> whereas a girl who's a six in Hollywood can be the hottest girl uh, ever if she's in Boise. True, true. So especially, it depends. Uh, let me try to phrase this point. So it truly depends on where what is. Again, the 10 in Hollywood will be a 10 everywhere, but how many Hollywood tents will be in bumfuck Idaho? Not much. Yeah. No, I think that's the biggest factor with it is just that uh, when we talk, when I talk about subjective value versus objective value, mm -hmm. what you're dealing with is um, an objective value is okay. How much did it cost you to produce that sprocket? Mm -hmm. That's the the materials that went into it, the labor that went into it, and everything. What's the price of this thing objectively? But when you look into subjective value, you're looking at how much is someone willing to pay for that? Because someone, if you're selling anything, uh, you have to value the money more than the item you're selling, and they have to value the item they want to buy more than the money. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you cannot trade, because if everyone agrees on the price of something, then you'll never have, because in that case, your product is going to be worth exactly as much to you as to the guy who wants to buy it, and where is your incentive to sell in that case? Mm -hmm. So that's where I think subjective value comes in and why that's really important because uh, if we had an objective sexual marketplace, then everyone, we could just pair people off um, by looks ratio exactly. We would have everyone's sexual market value. So you just go with your uh, sexual market value uh, diploma and you present it to a girl of identical sexual market value and be like, hey, let's hook up. We're the same. No, it's demand and supply. Yeah, exactly. So you're going to have some people who are in more demand than others. You're going to have some that are in uh, under supply. Mm -hmm. And you just have to uh, kind of try and balance out those factors. And one of the reasons why you get these. Um, let's call them clumpings, is that uh, Chris Rock's old statement that 20% of the guys do 80% of the fucking is pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. Because nature likes to experiment on men and it uses women to determine which experiments are successful. So you see a lot of more genetic variance in men than you do in women. You, you see this on IQ, you see it on mental illness, you see it on everything else. Mm -hmm. But women, they always want to, you know, want the top guys. So uh, a bad experiment won't be able to procreate. And then that nature knows, okay, this was pointless. I'll try something else in next generation. Hmm. Isn't that why most of us have, uh, what was it again? Three times the amount of female ancestors instead of male. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that one. Well, is that the reason why most of us have three times the amount of female ancestors than male ancestors? Don't know if you're familiar with that fact. No, I'm not familiar with that statistic, but it, I remember something I read from India where 
uh, the number of girls versus the number of boys that were born to couples depended on what caste they were in. Because um, um, if you have, uh, if you're really high value, you can have a lot more offspring as a man. Mm -hmm. But if you're really low value, you have a better chance of reproducing as a woman. For instance, if you look at royal families and really powerful aristocratic families, uh, they usually had more boys than girls, whereas the low classes had more uh, girls than boys. Because they could wed out the daughters. Because at the uh, top level, you get more offspring as a guy, because a guy can, in theory, impregnate a thousand women a year. A woman can only do one pregnancy a year. True. So if you're a real winner in the sexual marketplace, you can really maximize your number of offspring by being male. Whereas if you're uh, in the lower ranks, you will still probably be able to have some offspring as a woman, even though you're not really the uh, uh, bell of the ball, so to speak. <laughs> you didn't so, win the lottery genetic wise. No, so women are in kind of the, um, how do I put this? They are the safe bet uh in the sexual marketplace whereas men is it's more of a risky thing like if you're a guy who's really successful you can do much better than any woman in terms of reproduction but if you're a guy who fails out you end up doing much worse than your average woman so um, it's all on us to kind of build ourselves up into uh the type of guy who can be successful no and um, before we get into that the people who are live stick around for anyone who's watching this on rewind you can watch the full version of this conversation on patreon forward slash jack napier 368 if you enjoyed this please check that out to watch the full version of this thank you for everything like comment and subscribe and i'll see you on patreon now back to the live broadcast we are talking about building value as a man which is also your second book building value how much years were there between this one and the first one actually and about two two or three years i think i published building value in 2016 in march so i published the published building value in april so it's about three years Damn. also the second one has a lot lot of detail about everything uh i know you mentioned it yesterday during red morning but what was the sole reason for you to make this quote-unquote sequel to your first book well the whole reason for it was more or less that i a lot of guys will find uh, this uh, corner of the internet and they will start on all these different self-improvement efforts because there are a lot of things you need to kind of get a grasp on and you don't have to be an expert at everything but you should have a, an idea about them so guys will come in and they'll start to do everything at once and they want to do maximize in all areas mm -hmm. so they're going to the gym they're going to fix their diet they're going to get sleep they're going out and doing approaches and they're not getting a lot of the progress because they're prioritizing everything equally so part of my thinking was I don't need to write a book on how to develop your style or how to work out or that type of stuff because you have guys who've already done that. But what if you are coming in and you have to do like eight different things, like you're fixing your style, you're fixing your grooming, you have to get your ass out of debt, you have to finish, finish figure out a way to make money. Uh, you're uh, starting to work out and you're starting to do approaches and you start to learn game and how do you kind of prioritize these things and how do you manage so that you can actually make progress in all these areas so i kind of wrote building value as a framework for you can plug anything into that framework because the framework is just um this is where you are now and this is where i want to end up and then you go through and you go like okay what are going to be the barriers to uh, me being able to be successful and what are going to be the enablers that are going to help me be successful and then you work your way through the uh, model and you come up with a strategy you come up with a vision and a mission and then you execute that strategy and you have ways of tracking that strategy and putting uh, systems in place to um, make sure you're on the right track so you can have a chance of fixing things mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of guys become become jack of all trades, but master of none, just by wanting too much at once. 
Well, my thing with this, like, it's very easy to forget that what's the means to an end and start treating things at an end in itself. Like, a lot of guys will um, start working out and then they'll be like, hey, I uh, just brought my deadlift up to 700 pounds. Hey, that's great, man. You're looking good. How many girls have you hit on? Oh, crap. I forgot to hit on some girls. <laughs> And so the self-improvement is masturbation approach mm. where uh, they will still uh, they'll just uh, hammer away at the self-improvement because that means they'll never have to uh, hit on a girl and what they're really scared of is that feedback from reality and you kind of have to expose yourself to reality in order to get good feedback because it's very easy to kind of sit on your uh, couch and come up with theories and never test them in practice. And then you build this image of yourself as like this highest value guy. And if only the world was clever enough to spot it. Mm -hmm. uh, what's that called again? In action because of rationalization? No? In action because of uh, something, something. I can't remember what it is, but you, you delve into the theory so much that it stops you from taking action. Yeah, paralysis by analysis. Thank you, that's the one. And shame is that when these guys really start building their own value and they don't hit on women or go out and game, things like that, they will never realize how little looks actually matter. Uh, because to me, I don't know how that is for you, because I loved how much emphasis you put on working out uh yet there is something to me a lot of guys forget that the working out part is not necessarily to increase your breeding opportunities but mostly for yourself it is you who wants to look good for you that's when most guys hit miss the point what do you think about that yeah i agree with you i think a lot of these things are just things you're supposed to do like um i think it's uh Chris Rock who's, uh, has a bit about guys wanting credit for things that they're just supposed to do anyway. Like, uh, they are they want credit for taking care of their kids. Well, you're supposed to do that. <laughs> and it's uh, I think it's kind of the same thing with uh, a lot of guys is that they're just not, they've not really become adults and that they're not taking care of themselves. Like, I hate the word adulting so much i mean hearing that word makes me cringe harder than when john uses the term uh, gorilla pimp game <laughs> i hate that fast so uh that's kind of my stance with um with it is you have to kind of become an adult and that means paying your bills on time it means having a certain degree of control over your finances it means not living in a pigsty it means uh, keeping yourself in shape. You're not keeping yourself in shape just for girls. Like you can build muscle to get girls into your bed. You can build cardio to get them off in it. <laughs> but in the end, what you're trying to do is keep yourself healthy for as long as possible because nothing's, the worst thing is if you're, let's say you hit your forties and you're in such bad shape that you have the body of an 80 year old. So you have to start getting surgeries to fix everything. Uh, yeah. You're not really living a good life because you've abused your body to the point where if it was a car, it would have been um, taken to the chop shop already. No, I fully agree. And Jack Donovan made a very good point in the way of men. I don't know if you've read that. Oh, yeah, I did uh, a couple of years ago. Now, he made the point that masculinity these days is optional. And... I think he's 100% right, and that actually makes it very depressing for the times we live in now. Although that is the biggest reason guys find the sphere. They want to have that option. They want to be capable. They want to be successful, however you feel in successful. But as you just mentioned, having the body, body of an 80-year-old, but being 40, it's just... you. you how are you capable of living with yourself if you're not even capable of taking care of yourself at such a relatively young age? Well, I think it's just about like a lot of this thing would have been free before. Like my like if you go back a hundred years, most guys worked physical jobs. Mm -hmm. So that, that wouldn't actually keep them in shape. Like let's say you were out there with an axe chopping lumber all day. That's eight to 10 to 12 hours of working out for six, seven days a week. 
now most of us are sitting in offices all day, in climate-controlled offices, I may add. Mm -hmm. uh, you never have to be uncomfortable, ever. And I think that's kind of the thing. We're, we've constructed this world where no one is supposed to be uncomfortable. You're not supposed to be hot or sweaty or uh, have uh, delayed onset muscle soreness. You're just supposed to always be comfortable. And I think to become masculine, you have to make yourself uncomfortable. Because if you don't make yourself uncomfortable, you never grow. 100% agree. You have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's how... When I finally heard about the burden of performance, that truly fell for me. That truly clicked. Like, that's oh, I such... agree. The, the burden of performance is a central thing, but it's uh, kind of been forgotten in that it's very easy now for men especially to just kind of go on auto mode and mm. not do anything. Kind of feels like we've gotten obsolete almost. Strangely enough, you don't have to be strong. You don't have to be capable of fighting like the state and everybody else is taking care of you, which, well, in and of itself, just makes men weak. We need to have a purpose. Well, I think you have to create your own purpose. And I think that's kind of where a lot of guys who find the, uh, the red pill tend to go off the deep end because well, for a lot of them, their purpose was to kind of play this game that... Um, Rolo calls it the old books. Mm -hmm. And that's the game that they've, we've been playing for uh, hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. And suddenly the rules of this old book has changed. And the consequence of that is uh, when you take that old book away and they realize it's not real anymore, and uh, there's nothing left there. So they have to replace that with something. So uh, what they end up doing is they will find some woo-woo mysticism or they'll find God or they'll uh, go and find any sort of spiritual value. And that's why I'm always very, very uh, skeptical when guys start to talking about, well, we need to uh, you know, talk about spirituality and the red pill and we need to talk about morality and the red pill. And I'm like, I'm not a huge fan of that. I, I like making... Uh, judgments of value, not value judgments. Now, why are we applying chick crack to men? That's actually a very, I never heard it put that way. It's a great way of wording it. Like, why are a lot of red pill men so attracted to chick crack? Yeah, at least that's what it is to me. Like, I had a, uh, I had a venture past Wednesday, a very nice one, actually. But she started talking about, about Taoism, and I was like, oh, God, here we go again. Like, Start sniffing it up, girls. Here we go. Taoism. I mean, why why are men doing this? Yeah, real question, by the way. What do you think that makes men want to find that spirituality? I think it's because they never make themselves then want to a point of origin. They want to do everything to, they do for someone else but them. They lack that little bit of narcissism they need to fully fully become that valuable well i just think uh, for, for some men i think that's probably a case and i think for other men it's just because it's a useful uh, machiavellian plate thing for them to use to make them appear uh more noble than they perhaps are mm, that's a good one too like getting good favors with some people well you know it's one of those things like if you introduce yourself with you know hi i'm a good christian most people aren't going, like Ted Bundy, was, uh, he was deep into the Latter-day Saints in Utah. Uh, John Wayne Gacy was very central at his church. And a lot of times it's a good place to hide because you, uh, you can kind of hide. No one tends to assume bad things about people who seem to be involved with things that have a good reputation. So uh, even the even the BTK killer is perhaps my favorite one who used a church computer to write one of the uh, letters to the media taunting the police for not catching him. Really? That's pretty ballsy. That's hiding in plain sight. Yeah, and I think it's just the kind of it's an image thing. Like if you want to appear like if you want to appear like a philosopher and you want to uh, seem smart as uh, fuck. All you really have to do is use a lot of big words and talk about things that are non-measurable and non-falsifiable. 
because everyone can sound smart when you're they're discussing metaphysics and dropping a lot of um, five dollar words <laughs> but it can't actually be uh, measured and that's kind of the issue i have with it and why i try to avoid getting into those discussions because we can i could probably sit here and discuss morality with you for seven and a half hours it will not get any of us the fuse up and no one is probably going to enjoy that back towards the end and three i mean we're not creating any value by doing it we're just having my subjective worldview meet your subjective worldview and we're just going to sit here and uh, talk until one of us is like fuck this shit. <laughs> well i'm not drunk yet i'm not even started drinking i should but it's only half past two in the afternoon here so that's a bit early i don't want to look like my mother no oh, quite it's always five o'clock somewhere <laughs> yeah that's the one <laughs> Uh, well, let me see. Let me see. There was one thing in the book that I really liked and really want to talk about is that wanting too much at once. And you used the example of trying to quit sugar, nicotine, wanting to sleep right, working out six times a week and waking up early. And that that is unsustainable because of willpower, which will be depleted. And I don't know if a lot of men know about this. I've known about it for years, but I keep forgetting it because I have my fallbacks as well. But willpower can be depleted if you try to be good at everything all at once. Would you care to elaborate a bit on that more, the concept of willpower? Well, willpower is just really you have some i can't remember who i was yeah i was talking to ryan about discipline versus motivation so motivation is kind of what's get you started with things it's kind of what what you what gets you down the road but over time motive uh, motivation will fall and that's where discipline kicks in mm -hmm. like when you first get a gym membership you're really enthusiastic about working out and then uh, three, four weeks later and you're tired and your body aches and you're getting doms and you're, you've been uncomfortable and you're like, oh, I'll just skip that one day at the gym. And that's when you have to use discipline to force yourself to go forward. But whenever you exert discipline on yourself, that's going to take a little bit of energy out of you. I think of it kind of like a health bar in one of those uh, old school uh, smash em up games. Mm -hmm. That if you're using willpower to stop yourself from smoking from eating sugar eating caffeine etc you're using you're trying to do three difficult things all at once and sooner or later you're going to crack on one point of them so my thing is just figure out you know a couple of small things you can do and have one big thing that you're focused on just to kind of avoid getting into a place where um, you're just trying to be too good all the time and it becomes um was well the easiest thing is to do with diet so let's say you're on a cut mm -hmm. and you decide to uh cut really steeply so you're dropping a thousand calories a day and you're also going to work out and do cardio every day so mm -hmm. you're putting a lot of strain on your body and that might work for a week it can work for two weeks three weeks four weeks whatever but sooner or later you're going to have a crack and you're going to have that day where you just go to a family gathering or something and you eat a whole cake nine burgers and drink three cases of beer because mm -hmm. you kind of lose control over it and that kind of gets into that binge eating area and it's the same thing with like if you're quitting nicotine and then you you're off nicotine for like three weeks and then you have a stressful day of work and you buy a pack and you smoke 20 cigarettes in like 20 minutes <laughs> it's uh, kind of go goes into that so i that's why I, kind of why I, I look into that in building value as well is like if you're trying to do uh, you rank things according to their difficulty and how long it takes to do them like if you're trying to lose 100 pounds you should probably plan for a year or two to do that. Yep, agreed. And if you're uh, trying to get yourself out of debt, and let's say you're a hundred grand in debt, you should just calculate, okay, how, how long until you can get rid of that debt? It'll just take some time. And a lot of guys want all the results right now. So they want to go from, you know, an out of shape guy who's not making money, who, uh, it hasn't approached girls in years to like alpha chat in two weeks and it just doesn't work like that everything is kind of 
build from the ground up. And it's uh, one of the sadder things about humanity, in my estimation, is the fact that we, we're kind of built to not think long term. Mm. Yeah, they want, in, you, mm -hmm. they want they want <laughs> you go first. No, I was going to say, what happens is they'll be like, okay, guys can plan for one year. And they're like, I went planning way ahead. But you have to plan almost five or ten years ahead uh, on some level, like not in detail, but uh, I think having a three-year plan is a good one. And then just make sure you're moving in the right general direction. Don't set the plan like, okay, in three years I'm going to be 220, 10% body fat. But not in that level of detail, but just say, okay, I'm going to be in better shape than the now. And then you have some form of measure to track that. Hmm. Yeah, they, it's kind of like they want instant gratification for not wanting instant gratification. That's a bit of a paradox, maybe. But the reason why you get like 225 with a body percentage of 10 is, well, I think roids are involved as well, though. But you need to have patience and stop wanting everything right now when it comes to food and things like that. So you have to quit wanting instant gratification, but in wanting that goal, they still are depending on instant gratification, which is almost basically human nature these days. So, um, well, I think the instant gratification thing and also the constant success porn. Because if we're starting to look, I, I talk about this when it comes to like the guys who are Instagram uh, models for fitness. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of cases, what you're looking at there is, just to explain this a little bit, is you have a guy who probably started working out really young. So they got all the benefits of training with weights uh, when they were in their naturally high anabolic phase during their teenage years. Mm -hmm. then they are among the top responders to weight training with good muscle and joint attachments. So, you know, for instance, if you have a long bicep, you can never really get that peak on it. True. So, yeah. so or, you know, if you have really, if you have narrow shoulders by default, it's going to be a lot more work to get that V taper. So they have a lot of genetic things working in their advantage and they got into it early. They built their life around it. So now they're, they've gotten very far, but they're also among the 1% who are on steroids, but they're also among the top 1% of responders to steroids, because there are guys who can do massive amounts of roids and get very poor results just because they're not very, uh, they don't respond very well to it. So you're talking about guys with 1% genetics, 1% drug response, 1% discipline, 1% uh, luck in that case of finding something early. So you're talking a very unrealistic target for someone who's like 25, 26 and started working out yesterday. The good thing is you can put on a lot of muscle. Like most of the muscle you'll ever put on, you'll put on in the first three years. Yep. After that, it just becomes, it just becomes an uphill battle. After that, the uh, question, you start questioning yourself, also when you have low genetics, if you should take steroids. Because most guys on the internet, even in powerlifting, even in amateur powerlifting, like the top guys, like they they do roids. And I don't know if you're familiar with Louis Simmons, because he, he phrased it perfectly. Like they have to be uh, drug tested. So they have to be free during the drug test, but that doesn't mean they're not on drugs for the first six months. Like No, and a lot of the time you can also maintain, like I saw this, um, I was a Canadian bodybuilder and he'd been on roids for over a decade and he, he had one of those really, really um, huge physiques and he was trying to lose weight. And like I said, he barely lost any weight because there's just such a massive volume of uh, stored nitrogen in his muscles that it's going to take him years to just drop a little bit of it because you require a lot of extra testosterone to build it, but not necessarily to maintain it. Yep. But you can cut your volume in half. Uh, if I'm correct, 
for all your muscle groups, if you are training on maintenance, you only need 10 sets a week. That's nothing. Yeah, you can probably do that in one workout if you're mm -hmm. doing the big compounds. Yep, so, so shoulder, um, press, deadlift, shoulder press. So uh, yeah, deadlift, shoulder presses, squats, bench presses, uh, maybe throw in some directed arm work just for the sake of, um, but if you're doing rows, that'll kind of take care of itself. So, but it's, uh, that's kind of what I'm, my thinking is with the, um, with the uh, working out as well is that you have, you do something until you have it where you want it. And then you just kind of keep dial back the volume and you focus on something else and you just maintain what you've already built. Yeah, and that, that's where discipline comes in as well, because a lot of guys, they train for a certain goal, they finally reach it, and after that, it's like, well, I've reached my goal, now what? I'm on top of the mountain. I don't know, I know you're familiar with Stan Efferding, but do you know, um, what's his name, uh, Mark Bell as well? Yeah, uh, Smelly. Yeah, he's awesome, but he had this great... He had this great dialogue about mountains and very, actually very cliche, but it's true though that when you've reached the top of the first mountain, a bigger one shows up. So especially for guys, it never ends. And that comes all the way back to the burden of performance. For men, it never ends. It truly never ends. Well, for me, it's more about like, like a lifestyle design is a word I like to bring up every once in a while because I think it's important for guys to kind of figure out what lifestyle do they want. Because if you want to have like a constant stage ready bodybuilder type look, that is going to uh, require living like a bodybuilder. That means a lot of dry chicken. It means, you know, you saw it with Mark Bell too when he started to cut to do a bodybuilding show. Mm hmm. Like it was a massive change in his lifestyle because suddenly you can't have that. Uh, what was the thing he used to make when he was on keto? Like mixing coconut oil with melted uh, ninety percent dark chocolate and eating it like yogurt. So you can't do that stuff if you're uh, cutting for a bodybuilding show. So for a lot of guys, it's about dialing in that um, their value with what lifestyle they want. And I think that's um, that's kind of a subjective thing. Guys have to figure out, like, in how good shape do they want to be? Uh, how much money do they need or want? How much are they willing to work to get that money? So if you have to, you know, put in 80 hours a week at your company to get that going, do you really want to keep doing that for the next 10 years? Or is that something you want to do for a couple of years to get it off the ground? I think that's just kind of where you have to dial things in and then figure out, okay, here's the lifestyle. What do I have to do to enable that lifestyle? And you kind of go from there. Yeah. And that's why I think your book is a great asset to uh, preventive medicine by Rolo. Because for everybody who's read that, you've, uh, you come to understand that men peak later on in life. And why building value is such a great asset is men are success objects. So it's, nice and all that that men peak at 36 but the reason why is very different than from women women peak in looks and fertility around 23 22 but as a man being a success object that's around 36 if you stop wasting your 20s on video games and smoking weed and you actually read building value with the knowledge you have from preventive medicine then you have a golden combo as you just stated, the working out thing, like in the beginning, it would be nice, like before you become 30 or something, you you get the prize at the pro bodybuilding contest. But after that, it should be a habit, the working out part, not necessarily the competitions, but you should have made a habit out of just working out for overall health and physique. I think that's kind of where guys need to get is that they're not doing this to get girls. They're doing this to uh, live the good life that they want to live. And um, that's the way I look at it. Like in the beginning, you work out because uh, you want to get girls. And then as you go along, you start to work out because you realize you actually feel better when you've been to the gym. Uh, your body performs better. And I discussed this with Ryan. Like my goal isn't to be like in top shape, but it's where my physical condition is not a limiting factor. 
-hmm. So, uh, and I think that's kind of where you need to go with everything, like fi finances too. It, it work on it until it's not really a limiting factor. Like, okay, unless you're making a couple of million a year, you're not going to be able to uh, race Lambos through Switzerland. God damn it! You really, but do you really need that to be um, to be happy? And that's the thing is the meaning of happiness. Like, oh God. Uh, who was it again? Aaron Clary made a lot of videos about about that as well. Now, I prefer his minimalistic view of everything because, I mean, Maslow put it quite accurate. You don't need much to be happy. You just need people around you who you can actually trust on. Like the human validation of everything would be the true key to happiness. And I think Tate, even though he has the Lambos, the bitches and the wealth, I think he'd be miserable without his brother. Well, I think so too, and it's um, for me. It, uh, I think the Tate brothers are a great example because they're basically guys living the way they want to live, and they've kind of dialed in that lifestyle for themselves. And more power to them. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, you need to kind of have a mission and a vision of where you want to go. Because I think a lot of guys they kind of they read the script because they come from the blue pill condition and the script you get in the blue pill. Then they find the red pill and they're like, okay, what's my new script? Okay, I need to lift, I need to do my approaches, I need to do this and do that. And they just follow a script and they never ask themselves the question, what do I really want to get out of my life? And the answer to that question is kind of going to create um, a foundation for what you're building later on. Like, think of your life as a building. I mean, okay, you have to figure out, once you have the... Um, have the area you want to build in, then you have to figure out what kind of building you want to set up, what are the foundation for it, and you have to just work on it because it doesn't help you if, you, if you're sitting right now and you're like, well, I hate being me, so I'm going to try and be someone else. Where's the point in that? You'll be miserable as someone else too. You have to figure out, okay, what's my view on things? What's my value? And what do I want to go? What do I want to do? Mm -hmm. Like, and uh, we already stated it is not for the girls, but knowing what your specific sexual marketplace is is a very good help for that for knowing what you really want uh in yourself and your surroundings like what is your surroundings are you happy with that or do you want to leave that and what is needed for uh success and happiness in those surroundings and we've got a question by will the coldest cc i'll get to you in a second uh, sorry um, i didn't catch that there was someone blowing up my dms uh what was the question uh about will the coldest was carl if you are a six yeah. out of ten looks wise and body wise at the moment is online dating really the best bet or in person approaching? I like both, but the thing with, um, you can easily take a note from the uh, fat chicks on Tinder. You can do a lot with the right angle and the right filters. Catfish. Oh, yeah. if you, no, but if you're a six out of, like most women are who are five out of 10, look like a four out of 10 when you date, meet them, and they look like a seven out of 10 when you see them on their Tinder profile or their, or their Instagram. Most guys who are an 8 out of 10 look like a 5 out of 10 when you see their online profile or their uh, Instagram. And I think it's just about figuring out, you know, how do you present your merchandise in the best possible way? And a lot of guys don't know the, like, ask a girl to pose for a picture. She will automatically stand in the right way, the way that, you know, kind of catches her from the best angle and so on. Ask a guy and they just stand there with a goofy smile. <laughs> so it's all about with online dating you have to actually put yourself into kind of the female shoe shoes and do some marketing and figure out okay how if you are a six out of ten looks wise and body wise how can you look like an eight out of ten in your dating profile and most of the time the girls won't care when you meet them unless you're uh, there's a difference between you know framing things in the best possible way and outright falsifying things true the only thing I'm wondering is why he's formulating the question like that. Like he starts out with, if you are a six out of 10, my question would be, how do I become an eight out of 10? My answer would be first by building value by Carl. 
and then get your ass into the gym, start exfoliating, get a great haircut, and read The Appearance of Power by Tana Guzzi to work on your style. And then think about Tinder. But that will be me. Well, I think the easiest thing is you can do a lot. Like I, I talked to Ryan about this repeatedly, that I could probably add one to two points to any guy's sexual market value for in less than five days for less than a thousand bucks. Nice. Because what you do is most guys get cheap haircuts. They have no idea what haircuts look good on them. They usually don't, if they have beards, it's not very well taken care of. If they don't have it, it's just use the beard for what it's worth. And then, you know, most guys wear clothes one size too big. And they don't pay attention to things like accessories or shoes or anything that women look at. Women will automatically look at your shoes very early on. It's actually kind of fascinating how stuck uh, girls are like um, on shoes. Yeah, even on men. I think I was surprised by that as surprised by women liking male booty. For some oh, reason, I'm not I really surprised at that. that. But, uh, but it's also the thing that I noticed with girls with uh, forearms. Yeah, the veins. So it's kind of interesting with um, that whole look. But like I said, if we talk about building value, you just kind of stop. First, you have to think, like, what kind of value do you want? Like, most guys get so stuck on, like, they want to find a girl that they don't, they'll take any girl instead of having any preference as to what kind of girl do they want. And I think it's just important to uh, know yourself before you start making life-changing decisions. Yeah, start building value for you. Like, what do you want to be capable of? Yeah, so um, it's just a, a trade-off thing with anything. Like, if you do lifting, like, okay, you can be two, if you're 220, let's say you're six feet and you're 220, mm -hmm. you're not going to be as good for cardio as if you're 185. Mm -hmm. So if you want to lift heavier, you should probably be 220. If you don't want to lift heavier, you can probably stick with some better cardio. So it's just about what do you want your body to do? What do you want your life to be like? And I think that's kind of the core thing with everything. Just what do you want out of life? And I think a lot of guys never ask themselves that question. No, because I think that's because, and I mentioned this every episode, I think it really is because they've never made themselves their mental point of origin. They keep making women the mental point of origin. Or even worse, they're making other men their mental point of origin. Like, I, I like this guy. I want to become like him. So I'm going to try and adapt myself to thinking and acting exactly like this guy. Mm -hmm. What you end up doing is killing your authenticity. Yeah, they're idolizing other men. Because you're not going to live authentically if you're living someone else's life. Mm -hmm. Like, they... That's, that's a bit of the paradox, really. Like, they want to be like other men because they... They have what they want, but instead of realizing that the guy they want to be like is his own mental point of origin, they let that guy become their mental point of origin, thinking that if he does and use him as an example, they get what he gets, not knowing that the guy they want to be like does not give a shit about them. Well, I also think it kind of comes down to it's um, to live authentically according to your own image that they're still hiding from the consequences of that. If you're living like someone else, uh, one of the things that it never reflects poorly on you because I, you didn't make the choices. That was the other person who told you what to do. So you're not the authority in your life. So you don't take responsibility either. Well, you don't have to take responsibility. No, because it's not your mission and vision. So um, I think guys just have to be authentic and actually live... Uh, the way they want and with the purpose that they want in life and everything else will follow from that. But they also have to keep in mind that there are certain things that are, like if your idea of living authentically is sitting on your ass in your house, playing Fortnite in your gaming chair, uh, not working out, getting fat and uh, smoking weed all day, then that's not something that most girls will find attractive. No. So you're probably, you you can make that choice and that's a fair choice to make and then just you have to be able to accept the consequences because there's no such thing as uh not they're not being trade-offs you always have to do a trade-off 
Could you care to elaborate on that? Yeah, well, it's uh, like I said. I think like I said it on some other show that you know, if I could sit at my house, uh, watch Netflix, eat pizza, uh, and drink con constantly, and just have girls coming by every day to sleep with me, <laughs> I would. I'd never leave my house ever again. But the reality is that you kind of have to. If you want to have time to do things like work out, you're going to have to find that time somewhere. So if you're watching five hours of TV every night, you might be able to cut that down to four hours and you can uh, work out in that time. Or you can, but if you want to play, um, sit around and play World of Warcraft or Fortnite or whatever, 12 hours a day, and you still need to get your sleep, you still need to work, then um, you're not going to have time to do the other things. So you're always making those trade-offs. Like you can buy cheap mass-produced food or you can buy good raw ingredients and cook yourself. Uh, it, cooking yourself will cost you a little bit more time, but it has a health uh, benefit. Mm -hmm. So you're always making those choices and trading off between different levels of time and effort in, in exchange for, um, for results yeah. and consequences. It's the investment choice. Like, I want this, so I can't have this. What, what of those two things will have the most positive impact on me? Which one will have the most return of investment? The cookie or the vegetables? The uh, going drinking or working out? Just to name an example. So yeah, it's constant trade-off for everything. Partying early to bed. Yeah, you kind of, it's the um, same thing, like if you're up at four o'clock in the morning posting your watch on Instagram when you're doing burpees, you were not at, at the after party until 3 a.m. You went to bed at nine. Yeah, exactly. And you just have to make those choices. So, and I tend to say that if 80% of your choices are the right ones, and uh, when you can play with the last 20%, like you, if you have the vegetables 80% of the time, you can get away with having the cookie 20% of the time. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite um, cheat meal? My favorite cheat meal? Yeah, if you still have one every now and then. So, um, <laughs> I'm a big fan of pizza. Nice. So pizza's not like I've, I've never been much on the sweet stuff. Like I'll occasionally have a little um, ice cream or something, but I'm a big fan of um, like pizza's a good thing. Burgers are always good. Beer is always nice. Hmm. But if I had to go for one cheat meal, or it would probably be pizza. Nice. Not a bad thing. I haven't had pizza in ages. I'm more of a sweet tooth myself. But I should exchange that. Speaking about exchange for pizza. We have a great pizza parlor here where I live. It's amazing. Fuck. Now I have to get sure that. order in. Yeah, no, it's great. I, I sometimes take my plates there. They're like, I like pizza. Well, you've never had the greatest pizza. And they were like, oh, you're kidding. I'm like, okay, come along. And then afterwards, I was like, okay, you were right. Damn good pizza. Because I, I don't know if you're familiar with those um, kebab pizzas. I'm, I'm not talking about Italian pizzas. These are those uh, Turkish kebab pizzas. Oh, yeah, I'm aware of them. Like, Berlin is supposed to have the best, so I really have to go there sometimes. Yeah, Berlin is really good for gunner kebabs anyway. Yeah, I keep hearing that. I never had one. I've never been to Berlin. Berlin. So oh, I've been to, uh, like, Germany in general, I think, has the best kebabs in Europe. Nice. Well, maybe except, except for being actually being in Turkey. Yeah, I've been to Istanbul, but I have to say that, and maybe it's blasphemy that I'm saying this right now, but those Turkish kebabs we have right here in the Netherlands, I prefer those over the ones in Istanbul. Maybe I had the wrong one in Istanbul, but the one I had, it was nice, but not as good as the one here. No, I'm not sure. I've, uh, I haven't been uh, to Istanbul, so I, I can't speak for that. God damn it. Istanbul Istanbul is a very nice nice city. It's it's grandiose, the architecture, it's all amazing. But seriously, I was there on holiday and um uh, there was one day I just went out. I didn't feel like doing anything special, so I just walked out across the marketplace. Then some guy walked up to me. He's like, Mr. Mr. Very nice scent for your lady. I'm like, uh in Dutch. I told him, No thanks, buddy. So nee, thank you, Alfred. And he was like, 
Dutch guy. And he started talking to me in Dutch. I was like, you have got to be fucking kidding me. Like, no. And he just started talking to me fluent Dutch. And this was a holiday job for him. So he just started talking in Dutch to me about wanting to sell his scent. Like, crap. I was hoping I'd get rid of him. But no. I had to be a fucking Dutchie. <laughs> yeah, well... Snow on a place like like the Dutch people will show up anywhere. I think that's the way, reason why he became such great traders is like no matter where you go, there's always a Dutch guy there trying to make money off you. <laughs> yeah, we are great traders. Like the golden century was awesome for us. Which is strange because the Yanks have a lot of issues about former slavery, and for some reason we don't. And I think we were big culprits in that. Well, I think the funniest thing about the Dutch is that you have a lot of uh, beef going back history in Europe, like the English and French and the Germans have never been able to get along with anyone. And then you have in you know, all the Italian wars, the Dutch were always just quietly sitting on the sidelines, making money off everyone as the others were beating the crap out of each other. I think that's the kind of the funniest one. The Dutch, I kind of suspect that the Dutch were behind setting up all those wars just so they'd have a, a bigger market to trade in. Well, you wouldn't be wrong. I do know that the Dutch monarchy had a lot of uh, family members in other royal houses. Like we were wedding out cousins and nieces everywhere. I do know that the King of England one time was a cousin of our king or something like that. And it was all inbred. Like most, most uh, royal houses in Europe, by God, they were all related. But indeed, the most of them came from the Dutch. So yeah, I need to find uh, a way to monetize on this Manosphere bullshit that's going on right now. As a Dutch man, I feel my genes coming up right now. Well, that's a kind of a classical uh, thing, though, with um, all of the royal, royal families in Europe. I mean, the guys are so inbred, they make the Targaryens look normal. <laughs> well, <that's... laughs> well, at least none of them turned completely mad yet yet no the uh, the risks now are a lot less though because i mean it was one thing when you know a royal well um, when um the head of a country would have full control of its armies of all the taxes of all the people the risk now is a bit less because it's not like uh, the queen of uh, holland is going to declare war on uh, you know germany mm -hmm. so that's kind of the good thing with the royal family being one step removed from power true like that's the only good thing about the European Union. We stopped smashing each other's head in. For now. Well, I'm I'm just waiting for that to go back because I mean, the way it looks like for me, it's um, basically uh, takeover by political means because it looks to me like okay, now Germany is just in control of everything and they didn't have to fire a bullet. <laughs> Uh, we've been at each other's throats for like 200 years before that union started. Maybe even 300. Yeah, I imagine that's going to happen again, because sooner or later, you know, we've had periods of peace before and they never tend to last, and this one has been unprecedented in how long it's lasted. Yeah, it's human nature, warfare, like tribalism, things like that. It is in our nature, whether we like it or not. Like, we want to conquer and own things other guys have, I guess. Yeah, so I, I just imagine that's going to keep happening. So uh, I just like to be uh, prepared for it because, like, there's a limit to how long uh, Fraulein Merkel can keep the whole thing together. Yeah. Just like her hands. Have you seen that? So, it's like they're glued together. No, I haven't seen that one. But you have the, you know, you have the Brexit party. You have a lot of populists on all through Europe. So I imagine there will be some renegotiations on the EU. Oh, I yeah. They didn't like the fact that, like, when you switched from um, the old currency to the euro, mm -hmm. the euro was usually worth twice as much. Like, at least with Germany, like, they just didn't change the price of everything. They just changed it from euro, from um, marks to euro. So everything doubled in price overnight. Yep. The same thing here. Uh, uh, when the euro first came, everything uh, was cut in half. But if you start to look back, through the years everything doubled so the euro just got worthless actually like it used to be double the the gulden we used to have the gulden 
and now it's half. Oh, inflation. But yeah, tra the, some parties are screaming they want to have uh, our old currency back, but I don't know how that is going to work. I mean, I always find those statements a bit irrational. Like, the idea is nice, but how are you going to pull that off? You just can't flip a currency. No, it's hard to do, too, because, I mean, once you start switching currencies, you're going to have to redo all the debt you have, and you're going to have to start uh, changing things around. So uh, what's going to happen with that is you have to redo all the loans. You have to redo everything. So it's a hell of a lot of work. But uh, I don't I, I don't see the euro disappearing because I think it's actually a good thing to have a shared currency. Yeah, it's it's comes in handy. But it's just if if you could figure out a way where each where you can accept euros in all countries, uh, but kind of figure out how you can uh, do individualized state debt and that type of thing, because the issue here is that uh, you can't have a shared currency without a shared financial policy. Because like the Germany, Germans have always been kind of conservative and careful with their state's finances. The Spanish and Italians have, as a general rule, had to declare a bankruptcy roughly every 20 years. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, it's kind of like having sharing a bank account with your uh, cocaine addicted uh, <laughs> erratic little brother. It's not going to work that well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're gonna be like, okay, I just put three grand in the account, and he's gonna be like, yep, just book the hooker. <laughs> oh god! Like, I don't get why. I mean, I know this is an example, but there seriously are guys who share bank accounts with not their wives, their girlfriends. I mean, how in the world do you think this is going to end well? Well, my habit is just don't share accounts with anyone. Like, if you have, let's say you have a girl and you're living together. That way, and you have an apartment together. That way, then I would just set it up. Oh my God. Ryan, what's up, boys? Ryan! <laughs> hey, good guys, good morning. That's uh, the Toronto Tower, and is there a camera sideways? Oh, I'm on my phone right now. I'm literally phoning this in. Is that better? Nice. Yeah, well, yeah, don't worry about it. I'm used to you phoning it in every week. So, I don't know. So you Whatever. Hey, congratulations, guys. I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, Carl, you're officially part of the longest single episode of any show in the Manosphere now. World record. Four Is hours, eight record? minutes, 20 seconds. Yeah. Yeah, did I make it? Nice. <laughs> what, was the, what was the old record? I don't know. Whatever Roosh did. Three hours? <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, well, uh, that was kind of a hardcore show, I mean, to be honest. I mean, we were on for, because we were on like 20 minutes early before the show started. We were on, it's literally the only time I've, it, I've taken a break in the middle of a podcast to do another podcast and then gone back on a podcast. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, oh I know. I literally just sat there with my eyes closed and listened to whoever was screaming about the Jays game on the other side there. I like your thing about the 1%, by the way. I've been kind of listening in, and I was getting my morning routine done. No, that's a good thing. I mean, I, I like the one percenter thing, because you kind of have to be realistic with what whatever your targets are going to be. Because, I, like, you can either have, you know, real masculinity, or you can have fake masculinity. And fake oh. masculinity is unrealistic. So you're, you're just going to be sitting there, like, um, you know, blamoring on your desk like Vince McMahon with the uh, huge puffed up muscles and a gun in front of you and uh, <laughs> you're going to be kind of trying to make this fake image of yourself you know and you're kind of buying into your own kayfabe and I, I just don't think that's a good look oh I know you know the worst part is I remember back when social justice warriors were the big <laughs> enemy of the manosphere and I'm seeing a lot of those same behaviors come up which I guess is good because now we know exactly how to deal with them but it's very embarrassing what book are we talking about right now? Uh, doing a book right now, Jack? Yes, yes. We were talking about building value, but just in between, I want to congratulate you as well with your like-dislike ratio. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? Sometimes we're like a little children. It's a little healthy competition. But building value, I love that book. Carl gave me a little bit of an advanced copy as like a reward for helping him with the cover there. 
And the thing I love the most about it is it's so rare to find books in this space that are for helping men that actually have things that are actual and tangible. Everybody's trying to go mystical and everything that's very fungible. So it's a refreshing breath of fresh air in this space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we mentioned that before, like guys are trying to implement chick crack in the manosphere mm-hmm. for men. I'm just embarrassed about how effective it seems to be. Oh, guys, always, some guys try to find, how do I put that, meaning above their own meaning. Like they can't, they're not narcissistic enough to realize they need to be valuable for themselves. They always want a higher purpose, not knowing they are the higher purpose. Yeah, well, that's the funny thing about narcissism. As long as you have a script that makes no sense that you adhere to, it doesn't matter if you're like a good guy or a bad guy. Those martyred narcissists are just as bad. In fact, they're worse. At least the chest popping narcissist thinks he's the big, <laughs> the biggest guy in the world. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Imagine it's, that. It's been a weird couple of days. I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, the first time I actually had dudes slide into my uh, DMs to threaten me. It's getting interesting. Like half my DMs are just spamming me memes. The other half are like guys sliding into my DMs to threaten. Me. <laughs> That's so 1997 IRC channel. Fight me in real life, bro. <laughs> yeah, well, well, it's, it's like I'm a face and a voice modulator. Mm-hmm. It's like I could go to someone's house and they would have no idea I was there. I could be sitting next to them after family dinners and they would have no clue who I really am. <laughs> yeah. It's funny how at the end of the day it's so hard just to stick and hold frame. Like you're not going to threaten Carl. At least me, it makes sense. You can kind of triangulate my position. Mm-hmm. Whatever. But you're already in a... Um... In a self-reliant position, right? Like you don't have a job anymore, do you? Well, I am the job now, but yeah, <laughs> thank you though. <laughs> Actually, it does sound cooler when I'm like Big Lebowski, apparently, and not an entrepreneur getting started. But we'll go with well, that. To be honest, to be honest, you should just get a bathrobe and start podcasting in it. <laughs> yeah, dude. Oh, it was awkward. I did that one video where I started it off like from the morning in like a vlog format, and it was awkward as hell wearing that bathrobe. I don't know how John can do it. Even being in a t-shirt now, it feels like in my underwear with you guys. Well, hopefully you have some pants on. You're not just going walking around pantsless. Yeah, yeah. T-shirt and jeans. The the ultimate bachelor Sunday uh, outfit there. I don't know if you can afford not wearing pants with those dogs around, though. No, I don't think they're going to try and blow me. That's only the guys in Carl's DMs that are trying that stuff. <laughs> I can eat it, but... Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, kind of weird with the whole thing, but uh, I mean, we have a very, I'd like to, yesterday's show was fun though, I mean, we had a lot of good guys coming through, it was uh, very enjoyable to uh, meet some of the guys again. Plus, I mean, I haven't yeah, had that I remember something you told me about audiences. Forever. That is true, never had Dino Bravo come up in a conversation in years. <laughs> But it's not my like, and I see a lot of the regulars here in Jack's chat too. So I think it was you saying this before, where a lot of the time you're refining your audience the same way they're refining who they watch. And I'm not going to lie, like for all you guys, you've got a really switched on audience. I know fluffing your audience is like the easiest thing to do when you're on somebody's show, but like they really are switched on. Hmm. Like my DMs have been filled with nothing, but well, a lot of tinfoil hat conspiracy theories, but I'm amazed how close the guys have gotten with their little suspicions when they come to me and they're like, don't say anything, but I have a feeling it's this. I'm like, I don't want to say anything, but that's pretty good. <laughs> well, you know, guys, like I said yesterday, just make sure you don't spread that word where the two of the uh, 21 con speakers are banging. It's just not a good rumor, and it's, it's not good for anyone to spread that kind of gossip around. Yeah, guys, mm-hmm. we're very serious. Please do not spread that meme. The avatar Carl had yesterday was an IT problem. We couldn't help that. <laughs> I still laugh just thinking about it. God damn it. Um, I hope you don't mind, Carl. I'm going to fluff your book a bit here, too, on this. Uh, oh, I don't mind. So, Jack, you've read it, obviously, right? Yes, yes. Almost done with yeah. the audio. Nice. Well, uh, yeah, good point. <laughs> I'm reading it now on live. Um, it was one of those classic things that I remember from like way back in the mystery days and beyond where 
the only way this kind of works is when people take their like you know how we all have nerdy proclivities OCD we like writing everything down and like systematically taking things that should be a subjective experience like social activities and they make it objective which kind of kills the magic in it but as the part I love about Carl's writing style is that he kind of takes he's the equivalent of spreadsheet man and Skittles Man, if they had a baby, if you guys know what those two references mean. Not yet. Oh, Skittles Man is awesome. It's an old Roycey post before he went all, uh, you know, Heil. Um, he was talking about this girl's post where he just, she just went out freaking out about, this guy doesn't treat me well, yada, yada, yada. The only thing he's ever bought me, we dated for a year, is he once threw a bag of Skittles at me and said, there you go. And it sounded like she was just shit talking him, but he goes, yeah. And you see this girl, she's been, she's been dating him for like the last two years and she's a constant wreck of anxiety. And he goes, you guys need to be a Skittles man to the point where you don't offer anything except for your attention. And she treats it like cocaine or crack, I guess, like I would say. And then spreadsheet man was from an old post in dead bedrooms on Reddit that became super popular. I think they even had a New York times article on it. Seems to be the, <laughs> the thing lately. But um, every time he got shot down from his wife for sex, he would make a spreadsheet. He wrote down the reason, and he calculated, I think it was 157, or no, 57 rejections in three months. And some of the reasons were hilarious, like the Friends episode is almost over and stuff like that. And it was, it was a meme for the longest time where if a guy would constantly keep score about how bad his wife treats him in that, they'd call him Spreadsheet Man. And so that's why whenever I book, yeah, well, for you, it's a compliment because you kind of took spreadsheet man, and you turn him into Skittles man, <laughs> which I didn't think was possible. <laughs> and yet he did it. Mm. I'm trying to find Skittles man, but well, it's no longer available. You know, yeah, yeah I know there's one of those things that happens once you start, you know, getting into certain dark places on the web. You end up getting expunged rather quickly. There are certain things you probably shouldn't uh, mix with. Uh, oh, okay. actually, remind me that, Jack. When we're done with the cast, I'll send you a link. Somebody actually, I don't know how they did it, but they archived all the stuff. So. Oh, nice. Yeah, I've been kind of. I haven't been wanting to spread it around because I don't trust some random person who. Like, I have not no idea. It might be a honeypot to see who else is a white nationalist, and then whoever goes to that site gets their IP logged. But then again, we're just paranoid in this space. Heaven forbid somebody might start sharing doctored screenshots about you if you're not careful, you know? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, uh, it's a big concern. I mean, uh, never know when that's going to happen. And it's just not a good kid. I, I think it could be a challenge. We'll see what mm -hmm. happens with it. Well, I guess WordPress at least find, found the final solution. I'm surprised though. Four years of writing stuff. He never once like got his own domain. He just did his blog spot blog there and signed up. Well, I think that's kind of the. Uh, it, it was kind of known for that though. It was like the uh, longest running and most visited free blog in the manosphere. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> anyway, so I interrupted. What part of the, the the book were we talking about, or what were we talking about before I interrupted with my sunshine? <laughs> Oh, we weren't actually, we were beyond the book. I think we were, for a while there, we were discussing kebabs. Yeah. What's the greatest oh. kebab you've ever had? Actually, you know what? When it comes to all that food, the greatest kebab, well, the greatest kebabs I had were in Oman. I can't remember where they were, some little street corner. We were always warned against street meat, but this is one place so good that we actually broke that rule. But it was in, oh no, it wasn't in Oman, it was in Dubai. We were outside of the, uh, the, the souk area. I think we were by the spice souk and somebody was doing one there. Although it was indoors because it was 54 damn degrees and that was way too hot to be outside. Yeah. Solar power. But to be honest, being a Canadian in Halifax, they have uh, donairs there and we kind of Canadianized them to the point that they're the greatest thing ever. Their food's equivalent to crack. So which was it's yours then? I'm assuming one of you has been to Turkey? Yep, me. Yeah, what's what's nice. a Canadian ice kebab? Is that like with maple syrup on it? <laughs> maple syrup's a Quebec thing. Does the guy behind the counter apologize constantly? Oh, for fuck's sake. This coming from the Dutch. Hey, man, you keep this up. World War III, we're not coming to save you this time. <laughs> oh, damn it. <laughs> Listen, Ryan, you're Canadian, not American. You don't get to use that. We won't come to save you. 
<laughs> well, no, I don't know. You know this. World War II, I actually went down to, uh, well, I guess it was Amsterdam, so it doesn't really count. Because you're not from, uh, you remember you told me before, do you say that on camera where you're from or no? Uh, I only say I'm from the north of the Netherlands. Yeah, well, so I went to Amsterdam, and all the guys who will go down there for, uh, there's like a 100-man rucksack, or 100-mile rucksack march they do every year for the, the military, and the Canadians are amazed how well they're treated until I went to Osterbeek, <clears throat> and I saw the World War II Allied Cemetery there, and it was just, they still have like a perfectly manicured cemetery of all the Canadians that died liberating some of the villages out there, so I was like, that's pretty cool. Mm. Yeah, Americans didn't show up to save anybody there, up in North. <laughs> Uh, that came some point. Just like the Red Man Group episode, we punch above our weight. <laughs> 3,000 subscriber channel, pretty much outdid a 15,000 subscriber channel. Yeah, With hosts well, who have the equivalent uh, reach of about 200,000 people. Yeah, well, it, I can kind of understand why, though, because, I mean, uh, our, um, our discussion about wrestling was really good, though. So um, I think that's what pulled them away. True. Well, that, and we actually talked about intersexual dynamics. Heaven forbid somebody talk about the subject that we're all supposed to be here for. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what's the topic. Why you don't take your ex back? Yeah. I think, yeah, that was the one theirs was on. I, don't I know, haven't watched it. I was kind of busy at the time that. watching our cast. Yeah, I haven't watched it either. I mean, uh, there was nobody good on there. <laughs> oh, come well, that's on, right. like Donovan. At least I do. Well, I, I like Donovan too. I mean, uh, the junkyard, the uh, junkyard dog really punches above his weight. But I mean, Coco Beware is a bigger issue. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tate has finally uh, spoken out. Oh, really? Yes, Tate. What about the manuscript split? Nobody's gonna say my name from any side because they know I'll make a fool of them instantly. Nobody has the receipts I have. Step to me. Somebody try it. I'll annihilate anybody. Everybody knows oh. it. Oh, you know so, my yeah. favorite part about Tate? Like, yeah, Everybody. Tate's kind of a Tate's kind of like a porn lord. He's kind of a degenerate that, but you know what? He doesn't pretend to be anything he's not. And if he flexes, guaranteed he's twenty percent better than what he flexed as. Like he's very methodical, very switched on. I like that. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to understanding, here's my Rolo moment. When it comes to understanding hypergamy, like he knows the complete side of things. He makes money off of the, off of guys like sexual frustration. So he knows it better than anybody. Yeah. People get yeah. mad at his flexing, but I'm like, dude, you could you couldn't find a better teacher other than like Carla and me and you. <laughs> <laughs> I do my best. I do my best. Like, it's a great business model. Like everybody, and I think. Anthony is doing the same thing right now. Like everybody, the reason why they come to the manosphere and just use it against the guys who don't want to find the manosphere, like their sexual thirst. Oh, uh, I know. Quite brilliant. Well, that's the whole reason I, I actually opened up in this space and became in real life, because it's very easy to sell guys on not having to do any work and have a coping strategy. It's like the medicine is always more profitable than the cure. And then I thought, mm -hmm. well, let's give it a go. Let's actually see if we can properly fix guys, do the hard work. I mean, Jordan Peterson's huge right now, and he's he's selling them, like, clean up your room. That's as much action as he's given them, and he's made it that far. Imagine what happens when Carl and I tell them, hey, and hit the gym after you've cleaned it. <laughs> I did I'll be on Kathy Newman, Nellie Bowles, having them slander me on TV for 15 million views. It'll be awesome. We'll go viral. Nice. Let's try it. Mm. But seriously, though, did Peterson really say, wash your dick? No, or is that just a meme? Not. That's I mean, a meme. No, I would not be surprised. Seriously, but I've never looked it up. I was always like, yeah, whatever. It's a meme, but I wouldn't be surprised. No, no. no I just, yeah, we, I can't remember who started it, but it caught on like wildfire. We liked it because most of the guys that are in this red-pilled space, like Carl can vouch for this, they've already put in work. They cleaned their room like years ago. Then they started lifting, and then they started learning game, and then they started applying it to the rest of their life, and incomes going up, quality of life going up. And so when you hear something as quaint as, like, clean your room, it's the equivalent of, you know, somebody showing you the alphabet and teaching you how to read. What, meanwhile, you just finished your PhD thesis. It's well, I think almost the in is, a way. Well, I kind of get where he's coming from because a lot of the guys that are appealing to Jordan B. Peterson, because I kind of saw that, they're the kind of, I mean, to say, it's like, you know, um, uh, Rich and um, Sean has the show uh, before the train wreck. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, these guys are the actual train wreck. Mm -hmm. 
they're too poor to be able to afford a sex doll and join up on the uh, the new red men group. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't be hang out, hanging out with you guys. I will get attacked, I guess. <laughs> oh yeah, if you want to join that the the garbage fire, feel free. There's always room for one more. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to be professional about the whole thing, so. Uh... <laughs> Very easy to become childish and to start attacking people and you know and all that stuff. So I'd rather not. Yeah, guys. <laughs> but then my kind of view is if you're we're in 2019 and if if some guy is like you have to step up your phone game when talking to girls. I'm like, well, who's talked to a girl on the phone in the last 15 years? Yeah. It's like how you it's yeah, like the ultimate boomer move. Like, can you give how do you get a girl to give you her landline number so you can give her a call? It's like <laughs> you know yeah. more have phone numbers anymore. Boggled my mind when I saw they were sending QR codes around. I'm like, oh that's how we work now. Alright, fair enough. Yeah, well, Gotta have a level of anonymity when you're picking chicks up on Tinder. <laughs> Yeah, well, you actually have chicks who put like their um, QR code in uh, for a Snapchat in as one of their Tinder pictures. Mm -hmm. Like, just hit me. Yeah, I'm not is... on Tinder anymore. Just hit me up on Snap. Yeah, well, I found that out in 2017, where there was a bunch of guys at the 21 convention back when it still talked about game, sexual dynamics, and they were they didn't they talked to all these pickup artists, but then they went out at night for like the uh, main speakers event. And they just sat at a table, and all the uh, pickup artists went home to, I don't know, jerk off in the bathroom or something. And Hunter and I, of all people, had to go there and run like a set for him. We showed him how to do it, and then girls started swapping phone numbers and passing QR codes around. I was like, that's hilarious. Yeah, it's I also found funny it funny that two married guys were out doing the pickup artists that year. Yeah, well, you know, uh, a lot of the, uh, I'm sure a lot of the gang, the pickup artists who were talking there, uh, they focus more on the artist part than the pickup. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I wouldn't even say the artist. I think they. I think they need to focus on putting that sandwich down. But, uh, but that's why Gendernomics too is a good book because you actually have that stuff. So, like, you cannot read that book and follow it even fifty percent and still be able to bullshit yourself. <laughs> like you've made things about as objective like as you possibly could. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of guys are just in that space where they're just never going to do anything that's uncomfortable to them. I talked to Jack about it earlier. It's just like guys are pathologically addicted to being comfortable. Mm -hmm. And you know, putting just, down the sandwich is uh, well, you know, putting down the sandwich isn't comfortable. Going to the gym is mm -hmm. not comfortable. But you know, being uh, three hundred pounds, having a you know a waistline that's uh, about equator size, and uh, using a mobility scooter to get around a convention, uh, that's really comfortable. What do you think is worse, being a soy boy or a sow boy? What's a what? Like that's a, a bovine reference there, cows. Being the fat incel or being the ultra skinny emaciated incel, which one do you think would be worse? Which one do you think is harder to get out of? That's a good question. I would say the, the fat guy is probably a bigger issue to get out of. Because at least the skinny incel, he, he can still wear normal clothes, he can still wipe his ass. <laughs> yeah. I mean, once you can, if he has the energy for it, sure. Well, you know, once you start wiping your ass with a rag on a stick, you kind of cross the boundary there. <laughs> You're on fire this weekend, man. <laughs> uh, so, um, for me, that's just kind of the big thing. It's like it's okay to be like you have uh, you have you know strong fat, and then you have fat fat. Mm -hmm. Because like I know a couple of guys, especially if if you hang around Eastern Europe, this is uncommon to run into guys who are pretty burly guys have a bit of a gut, but they can you know knock your ass out with a half-ass backhand slap. Oh yeah, bear strength kind of guys. Yeah, and, and then you have, you know, what I could refer to as Walmart fat. <laughs> I like those ones. That's the one where their belly button becomes the new ass crack and their front has an, like, an ass hanging out. So I don't love it. It's actually disgusting, but <laughs> it's it's you can see it a mile away. <laughs> yeah, it's the, you know, they, they're stepping up their FUPA game. Although now that you're back in, uh, now that you're out of the States, you probably don't see that much at all, do you? Or is Europe too far gone as well? Well, it's less, thank God. Because we still don't have, like, fat acceptance isn't big in Europe. 
So it's like the further east you go, the more fat shaming uh, becomes a central topic. Like if you go to like Korea, they are savage. Oh yes, that I've seen. <laughs> But it's not like just people, it's in official public transport. Like Jeff, I think Japan put some shit in where your company can be held accountable if you get fat. Really? Yeah, there's really? a law around that with, uh, you know, they can get people to uh, work out and stay slim. Nice. I think, it's Thai, I think it was Thai Airways got a lot of shit in Europe for being specific, like you have to be thin. Uh, feminine and wear makeup and wear high heels to work as a stewardess for Thai Air. I love them already. You know, the funny and thing is that everybody else has that same standard. It's just the only difference is they were being open about it. Yeah. It's funny how being you're punished for being honest. Well, you're also punished for being healthy these days. I mean, uh, I had a discussion with a co-worker of mine. I have some fat co-workers who use the elevator for one-story stairs. Seriously, it's like a two minute, it's not even a two minute walk, it's less than a minute walk on that stairs and fat people keep taking the elevator. And I was like, they should make the elevator exclusive to people who have a pass. And they were like, Jack, you can't say that, that's just good discriminating. I'm like, no, I'm saying we make the elevator available for people who actually need it, like the disabled, not the lazy. Well, to be fair, lot. being morbidly obese is pretty much a disability at this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not morbidly yet. But still, like, you're taking away their opportunity to actually function. I'm like, we, we are helping them by making the elevator exclusive. But no, they wouldn't have. I was excluded. Yeah. What are you Apologies there. Oh, I'm already going to call but uh, I'm kind of liking how your um, yeah, Brian was rich Cooper. <laughs> I know it's damn it. Oh, this is ridiculous. Am I still on this call? I can't tell. Yeah, yeah you're, you're still, still on the call. I've never actually used Hangouts on a phone before. This is all new. But yeah, well, damn it, you guys are all doing the same thing. Like right behind this, I know for a fact you're sitting there in a Hawaiian shirt, a pair of shorts, <laughs> chilling out, staring out the window at this wonderful day. Like, let's face it, like if we were just sitting in our mom's basements doing stupid podcasts with the honk honk meme behind us, who would listen to us? At the same time, like we have lives, we do enjoy ourselves. Yeah, true. You know, I'm in my, uh, my t-shirt with uh, Carl Dustin get fucked, Carl Dustin fucking on it. Nice. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was, was hilarious. Too, right? No, I... Oh yeah, in Germanic text. Yeah, in Germanic text. <laughs> I also have it translated to into Chinese, just in case I'm working in China. <laughs> that reminds me of that old Simpsons joke. I don't know if you, if you guys ever really watched The Simpsons with Sideshow Bob and things like that. Like, Dude, I can quote the first ten seasons verbatim. Oh, nice! Like you remember the uh, Sideshow Bob episode where he's on trial and you were like, you have a die part die tattoo on your chest is that right oh no it's oh, yeah. german d part d yeah <laughs> oh he's so well educated i was saying who earns <laughs> yeah first 10 seasons of the simpsons that's how i got through college was watching all those well, i guess high school college well first 10 season is good but um i have watched all 20 so i kind of wasted uh, a couple well i wasted 10 seasons there mm -hmm. Oh, I grew up. But hey, should I should I talk about that thing I just got DM Carl or no? Well, uh, do you DM me something now, or do you mean that thing earlier? Just the one you I got sent just now. The response, the savage. Oh, that, yeah, I, I actually did find that funny. But uh, it's mm -hmm. uh, this guy has um, amazing uh, meme game. <laughs> It is funny though, yeah. That uh, this whole thing. A lot of these guys were like the 4chan meme meme artists there. So, it is very interesting seeing how people meme the the manosphere at the moment. <laughs> I I can't believe there's that Google at tech that's memeing the manosphere and like slipping it into podcasts. Though I'm really really annoyed with that. Very unprofessional of them. Yes, it would be a shame if somebody posted a meme right here, especially one that they just got in. Please, <laughs> I beg of you. <laughs> Please. 
Anyway, so I can't see. How are the viewerships going? How many how many guys you got in here? Are the um, likes? Do we have enough likes? If you guys aren't liking and subscribing to Jack, then you're doing it wrong. Yeah, we actually we're actually doing pretty decently. Like uh, we have 27 watching, 21 likes. Nice. At 26 now, so uh, no dislikes yeah. so far. So uh, hopefully uh, we'll maintain that good ratio. <laughs> yeah. Well, for those of you guys in the audience that don't know why everybody always asks for likes. It's because uh, YouTube factors engagement into a video. Like their whole time is they're trying to find a, an algorithm to decide whether a video is worth promoting or worth not. And so the only ways they know is watch time. So if you actually sit down and watch the whole thing, even if you're in the other room getting a sandwich, because YouTube can't tell that, then it says, okay, then this is keeping people on the platform so it's more valuable than if you just skip ahead on something, as well as likes, uh, comments, subscribes. They kind of devalued it now, but I mean, that's the only way you get things at the times when you subscribe. So the more you support Jack, the more content he's able to make and the easier he time he has it to be recommended to other people. Yeah. So I can imagine, yeah, somebody watching 33 Secrets or one of the 817 incel channels out there with some anime Abby, all of a sudden gets a recommendation for you talking about gendernomics to building value. They end up watching that. They decide to stop being a fat alert ass, hit the gym, just some small victories. And I mean, it's not unrealistic to say you could save somebody's life in a roundabout way just by having somebody smash a like here. Now, I'm not saying that. That's a bit hyperbolic, but you get where I'm going. Oh, 22 likes and 26 watching. We're gaining up. There are four people not liking. See, I told you, man, the audiences are switched on. Like, you can tell. The one good thing about this beef is it really is separating the wheat from the chaff. When it comes to yeah, viewership yeah. on all of everybody's channels, yeah, I agree with you, and I think the good thing is, I mean, hopefully uh, the wheat will notice who be, who's getting the shaft. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, Carl, or the, or the thirty shafts. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> I really love that meme, by the way. Jesus Christ, he wants he wanted to look so awesome with that with the John Wick photo and you just completely ruined it. Oh no, sorry, Google IT ruined it. Yeah, yeah. I, know. I have no idea where all these memes why where all these memes are coming from, but these guys are really being creative with some of the stuff they're dropping. The one thing I will give that meme, it's very tasteless and unprofessional, but he didn't blink. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, uh, I think that's uh, kind of a habit. Like, uh, I mean, not blinking isn't that kind of a sign that there's something wrong with you? Oh no, no, no! It's I think it's I think it's too much alpha, which I guess could be a problem when you when you have too much alpha in your in your body, you probably die young. Well, I, think but, I mean, that's the price you pay for only banging nines and tens, right? Yeah, uh, I think you I think your eyes would get uh, fucked up because you would just dry out. I think it's the tactical <laughs> show that improved this vision over nine thousand. Dude, if you're not crying to keep your eyes moisturized when you don't blink, then you're just too much beta. Sorry, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> but we're petty. I did, we just ruined your podcast, Jack. I'm sorry. No, man. this, I'm, this I'm, is going I'm, to uh, this is his private one for Patreon. So we were kind of done with the official stuff like uh, twenty well, an hour ago. Oh, good. So we can talk a little inside shop then. Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, I figured we'd uh, save some time once we wrap in about twenty minutes to do some inside shop on the back end. Yeah. yeah. I'd like oh. That. So, uh, if you gents don't mind, there was one little thing I'd like to uh, discuss about building value, and Ryan, glad to be here because you can give us some insight on this as well. And that's mission and vision. Now, Carl, could you elaborate more on mission and vision and why it is so important to get those two straight? Well, the only the real reason why I have them is that uh, your vision is just kind of an overarching. It's not all that concrete. And the whole idea with the uh, model and building value is that you start kind of abstract and undefined and your goal is to get extremely defined near the end. So by having your vision, you are naturally kind of limited what you're doing. And by adding your mission, you're further limiting. And then once you've limited down there, you can start to go with specific strategies and start to look at uh, doing uh, concrete and actionable things. But without that uh, mission and vision, you're not going to be able to limit what you're doing. And it's uh, one of the things I think I write about in the book is being 
very specific with the words you're using and you know avoid using fluff fluff terms because a lot of the times guys will add fluff and they'll be like well it doesn't matter if i'm uh, getting laid if i have to be a degenerate to do it or if i have to be immoral to do it and i think it just comes down to uh, okay fair enough if you want to be you know that type of value guy be that guy but don't complain when uh, you don't get the value out that you're supposed to get out because you have to be I mean, the real world is a real world, and no matter what kind of uh, bows and rainbows you put on it, it's uh, it's a dark world, lads. Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, It's a dark world, Charles. (laughs) (laughs) Get your samurai sword out. Learn to... I can't even do it. Yeah. Yeah, no, that was my favorite part of it. And you know what's funny, Jack? You remember our talk on Wisdom of Psychopaths? Yes. That is kind of, it resonates with that same message we talked before about that, uh, how a psychopath tends to think in the now. Mm -hmm. So like when you have these abstract things that Carl was talking about, like the vision, and you'll see a lot of guys do this, where they, in their head, they know exactly what they're trying to get. They're chasing a feeling, but they can't quantify it. And that's what I loved about the mission vision thing. Carl put it way better than I ever have. Um, But it's that same thing that psychopaths have. They have that... They start with a goal and then they work backwards from there. And then it has to be concrete because it's mapped to different steps along the way. I think so as much as Dark Triad is, they always think of it as some edgy, you know, conquering the world, badass, alpha, 30 guns around me type activity. A lot of it is just being strategic in the way you approach your life. Mm-hmm. Which really, it doesn't sound as fancy on a brochure though when you don't say Dark Triad with a samurai sword on it. But I mean, it's more effective. Mm-hmm. And it's like Carl always says: if you have to tell people you're being Machiavellian, then you're not being Machiavellian. No, no like we did, we discussed that as well. Like a true psychopath and a true Machiavellian, if he's being tested, they'll never know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you're good because at it, because he doesn't want to get caught. Well, that's yeah, well, that's, that's, that's why it's better to not be a good one. Well, a lot of what we do is, is signaling, and a lot of the when you're signaling masculinity, it's. Uh, Margaret Thatcher has uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, statements on it. Like, if you have to tell people you're a lady, you're not. <laughs> people that you're powerful, you're probably not. Or in my personal favorite iteration on it, if you have to tell people you have a big dick, you probably don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, Carl, Kalis the Emperor wants to know if he needs to read Gendernomics Gen- 1 to understand Gendernomics 2. No. Well, you need to buy it. That's for sure. Buy both because I need the cash uh, until I can launch my uh, add six inches to your account in uh, these, uh, five simple, uh, these five simple tricks course. I mean, it will be out only 10 PDFs available. The price for one company. Well, here's the value, and this is why I love Carl. So, 12 rules for life is 12 rules. And what do they charge for that? 20 bucks? I'm not sure. I'll check Amazon. Yeah, Carl charges 10 bucks, and he's got about 136 rules in there for helpful. So your, your rule to dollar ratio is just amazing. And for that reason alone, like you can buy both books three, four times over, and you're still coming out ahead. And that's from Jordan Peterson stuff there. No, for crying Granted, out. Granted, I don't think you have a section in there about cleaning your room, but you know what? The one rule, you can pay the extra 20 bucks for Peterson if that's what you really want. But I'm sticking my money where it gets the most value. Yeah, the funniest thing here, I, I just looked up 12 Rules for Life. It's uh, thirteen ninety nine on the Kindle. But the funniest thing is it, the book is it's like a tiny book with 12, 12 rules in it. And some some dude actually wrote a summary of 12 Rules for Life and Antidote to Chaos by Jordan Peterson. If you need a summary of 12 Rules for Life, it's like, what the hell's wrong with you? Maybe that's <laughs> what I should do. Just do a Cliff Notes of Gendernomics 1 and 2. Get those with the old school orange backing and sell those for like a dollar more and see who buys them. See how much of a, of a premium laziness costs. Well, I guess that kind of defeats the purpose of your book, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, it does, but uh, you know, it, if you need a summary version of Wash Your Penis, I mean, why are you even washing it? <laughs> well, at least we got the dog back. Yeah. Yeah, they're freaked out right now. The cat's hunting them. Yeah, if you guys don't have a pet, it's always nice to have a pet. They're very, they're very relaxing, and it is nice to see something 
that uh, uh, whatever. I'm getting all sentimental. Screw it. No, Dogs no, are cool. no. It's Get okay. One. Uh, it's okay. But I don't have pets. I just have two plates. I can put a leash on. Same thing. Fuzzy, not fuzzy, not fuzzy. I'm assuming. Yeah, not fuzzy. I took care of that. I don't know. Furries are a thing. I don't judge. <laughs> <laughs> hate to steal. Yeah. Your, hate to steal your thunder, Carl. I was informed that you're a bit of that side as well, and you don't want to be confronted with that in public. <laughs> Remembering your last tweet. Hmm. What was I? Uh... It's the one where you wanted to stay anon because you didn't want to be talked to in the street with a plate while somebody would ask you, hey, is that the slut you like to tie up? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's kind of a general rule for that because I know there are guys who would be that socially uh, uncalibrated <laughs> that they will just like kind of walk up to you randomly while you're... Uh... Like, regardless of what's happening, they just walk up to you. And I don't really like that happening. Mm. And the worst part is they think they'd be, like, doing it as a fan. Like, oh, he's going to love this. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, I Gendernomics mean, 3, social, social acceptable behaviors. <laughs> Gendernomics 3, don't be a fucking spurgy. <laughs> <laughs> like, you can make a rhyme out of it. Like, Gendernomics 2, building value. Gendernomics 3, social awkwardly. Things like that. No, no, you can do gendernomics building value, uh, and then gendernomics. Don't be that dude. <laughs> Twelve so, rules for not a, being him. Funny thing too about gendernomics and this whole recent scenario. I think I've always said, and Carl always says the same thing, when you're looking at people, stop looking at them as if they're some kind of archetype that you want to live up to. Like you're not looking for a Michael Jordan poster to put on your wall. Yeah, well. But you look for people on the value they bring in your life. Now, Carl, me, Rolo, I'd put those guys way on the further side of this than me. Very good at producing content that allows the guys to get more sexually successful in the current sexual marketplace. Goes without saying, hands down, 100%. The one thing, though, when guys like him or Rolo or myself have been working very hard at that part of it, is we're not good at snake oil. And the one thing snake oil has is it gets your attention. And so the one thing that's been nice about all this is we've been surrounded by it. And we've done our best to learn what we can learn. And this is the part that's going to be very exciting over the next year. Carl's third book when it comes out, the, the show your show is that we're taking all these lessons we learned from snake oil salesmen and we're going to be applying it to things of actual value. So I'm like, all this hate that comes around, all I think about it is, you know what, man, if it was easy, somebody would have done it by now. And I'm looking forward to what what's going to happen here in the next little bit, especially your channel. I see it's blown up in the last, how long have you been around? Like two months now, three months? Oh, Carl or me? You. Me. Um, January. So it's about six months. And yeah, like, have you seen what the average channel does? Like, you've already blown past their expectations. Yeah, I know. Like, my Twitter's been exploding lately. Mm -hmm. I'm already at 328, and I'm at how many subscribers? Let me check. I think I'm almost hitting 250. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to fluff your audience again. I hope you guys don't mind. Send out in the comments if you want me to stop, and I, I'll stop, but... Like, these guys, they've had nothing around but snake oil salesmen for the longest time. People selling them on Dreams, RSD, with, like, goofy hats and stuff like that. And it must be refreshing to see somebody, like, if you do this, your chances of getting laid go up. Or if you do this, and this is why you do it, you can stop reading Nietzsche and then uh, screw it up your life. You probably want to mute me for a bit. The train's coming by. Okay, one moment. Can I even mute you? Yeah, you should be able to. Oh, wait, I can do it, too. Oh, okay. Shame. No, uh, I, think me... thing with it, I think just guys get uh, too focused on signaling and they want to signal that they are a given thing and they're more, they're building more skills in signaling than actually being the things they are supposed to embody. So you have someone who gets really good at signaling masculinity, but who acts like a girl, or you get someone who's really good at signaling high value. Like pickup artists used to have this problem back in the day, mm -hmm. because style and mystery ran into was that they were able to signal being high value men in the club when they were picking the girl up, mm -hmm. but they couldn't maintain that into a relationship. And that became a major issue for them because how do they bridge that gap? Because once you're in that relationship, being perceived as a man of high value um, 
is an important one, actually being one, because you're not going to be able to keep up your act the whole time uh, you're going through uh, when you're going through that relationship. Like if you're waking up at six o'clock in the morning and your girl is like, there's someone in the house, you're not going to have time to put on that pickup artist face. <laughs> I'm going to agree and amplify him out of the house. I was going to say, that's the male equivalent of when you wake up the next day and you see a, like a face-shaped makeup stain on your pillow and then you look over and who do you really show up with? You're like, Ew. Or that three in the morning when they turn the lights on at the bar and you're like, ah! No. <laughs> turn the lights off! Let me have my, let me have my fantasy. <laughs> well, that's mystery. Once the mask and the, and the top hat comes off, then you just got the real him, right? Now, for some odd reason, I never was much into RSD and things like that. Maybe I saw through the snake oil, but I was always more into um, not what got me laid at one night stand, but what got me into keeping them around. As in, I've got two plates right now, and one of them is trying to uh, trying to get me into a relationship and things like that, but I'm just holding frame and saying like, honey, we're having fun right now. I don't want to meet your parents. I'm not going to meet your parents, and they are never going to meet me. Now, either you still like hanging around me, or you have to look for somebody else. But has she cleaned your house yet? This was. Well, funny thing is, we were talking about cleaning your room. I wanted to mention I never clean my room. I just let her make a mess, and then I tell her to clean it up with the rest. Oh, because that's always the that's always my telltale sign when a girl's really trying to hook you in for the long hauls when she cleans your house on you. Now, hey, about that, now that I've got two of more experienced men than I have, my biggest beef with this plate is that she has an excruciating notch count. And I know that the biggest beef with that would be the alpha widowing thing, but the way she's treating me, I'm thinking I'm the one who's going to alpha widow her. I think she's got short-term memory. Memory that of a goldfish. <laughs> Honestly, I had one of those. The serial monogamy uh, it was a girl I sailed with. Her name was Stacy. And every month she would be dating a new guy because as long as it's a boyfriend, then it's not uh, then it's not just a one night stand. Ah. And then his hammer was huge. A month later they'd break up. His hammer was tiny, and there'd be a new boy. And then afterwards, yeah. No, she started all the greatest. You're, she started mentioning it after three months or something like that, and I was like, no, 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 no. You knew what this was, and we're gonna keep it like that. Just maintaining frame on that one. So what's considered bad for you? Are we talking triple digits? High double digits? High double digits. Well, that's not bad. I thought you were talking oh. about triple digits. Oh, dude, you met her at church, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't meet her at church. No, it's just a thing that made me think like, well, she's nice company. Should I, at least since I'm not in a relationship with her, should I really worry that much? Like, I'm aware enough to prevent this from exploding right in my face. But I was, I was expecting worse from a girl with such a high notch cap. And, and up until now, she hasn't given me solid reason to really next her. So I was wondering, hmm, what's up with this? Or she's really good at hiding things. Well, it's not that you're focused on, your, on what you want, holding boundaries. That's all that matters. Yeah, and I'm doing that because I do not want to meet anyone's parents very soon. Well, my rule for that is uh, I have to know someone 12 months before they can meet anyone else in my life. Yeah. And then uh, 16 to 18 months uh, before I make any kind of like serious decision making. Like I, because for the pure, uh, uh, for the purely for the reason that a crazy person can usually hide the crazy for a year, year and a half. But, mm. you know, after a year, a year and a half, if you've been around them enough, their mask would have slipped a couple of times, like you, the time she screams at a random chick at Walmart or some shit. <laughs> my God. So, uh, that's kind of been my thing with it. And I, I don't really, fo I think a lot of guys are kind of like over-focused on notch count just because, well, you know, if she's been with 70 guys, I bet like eight of them had bigger hammers than me. And I, I think it's just insecurity on the part of the guy. Like, I, I wouldn't wife up anyone with a notch count of, 3,000, but at the same time, it, who cares if it's just a plate? Yeah. No, I was just wondering. She hasn't gone mental, and I was expecting her to go mental. So it's more On like... The thousand cock stare is a meme, dude. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, I have seen it. It's just it. heuristics. It's this. It's just like guns. Because I don't get it. I treat all guns as loaded. This one's not loaded. What gives? Yeah, yeah, that's that's. You're missing the point if you're looking at these things like they're, like they're able to map 100 percent to people's behavior. They're just heuristics. Yeah, that's why I like but that fact. You had it in your head. Yeah, it it influenced your behavior to the point where you're beneficial. Yeah. So if you think as soon as a girl is in like triple digit notch count that she's probably damaged, you're keeping an eye out for anything, and you're not ego invested in hand waving away all of her bad behavior. And yeah. so when she doesn't show you any of those things, you're able to make your judgment then. Yeah, that's why I like Tate's approach so much. He's like, um, well, I know oh, yeah, he's hard boundary enforcement. Oh yeah, I know he's exaggerating because you know BDP is quite a thing. But he's like, no, it doesn't exist. Your pimp hand is weak. So I'm like, god damn it. <laughs> but he has a point in it, not the point. He has a point. Mm -hmm. Well, Tate oh, yeah, is just on the. Tate just has a very, very hard frame. He just draws very hard boundaries, and it's like, this is what I want. This is unacceptable to me. Either live with my boundaries or get the hell out. Comply or goodbye. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah, you take the most Christian trad con who wants his virginal wife, you give him Tate's boundaries, I bet you anything, he'll have Norman Rockwell coming back from the dead in a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah, well, Tate has the... Um, it's something you've talked about, like the state plan is the same as the gold plan. And mm -hmm. that's the same thing with uh, Tate all the time. It's like, okay, if the girl leaves, he's still going to live the exact same life. Yeah, exactly. Girls are drawn to that too. That's the thing. Like the less he cares, the more attractive it is. It's life's cruel just, joke. They only give us but, what we don't want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's kind of the issue with a lot of guys though, is that they, um, they find that one girl who they let who they treat differently because she's some kind of wish, wish fulfillment or fantasy fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of forget all their stuff around her. It's why the purple pill is so uh, sweet. <laughs> True. I like hey, how you put that. Just a quick announcement. Oh, fuck. Now it's 28, 27. But I had the watcher like ratio equally just now. Well, that's what happens when you have a switched on audience. Ah. These guys are great. Now, I'm yeah, talking 20, IQ 120 at minimum. At minimum. Yeah, we got 28 watching, 27 likes. I need one more like. Come on, guys. Probably like right. for the dog. How can you not like the dog? Oh, yeah. Do I count as a watcher? Because that might be me then. Yeah, you do. Really? Oh, how do I like on the phone? All right, I got to do boomer things on the phone. Oh, I liked as well. Uh -huh. I never feel like oh, you. <laughs> I never feel like liking. You're like that politician that loses his own election because he forgot to vote for himself. <laughs> never, not, never like my own things. It feels like masturbating. Like, look at me being awesome. Twenty-seven guns around me. Well, like, yeah, I have to watch I'll, that. I'll shit. retweet. I'll retweet my own tweets, but I won't like my own tweets. Yeah, like that. Well, I don't even like what? to like. For me, liking is just like a bookmark for later. Usually when I like someone's tweet, it's like, uh, good job, buddy, but I, I cannot um, share that meme. <laughs> please, do not yeah. drop the memes on Twitter, please. So, you guys yeah, want to wrap this up? It's your show, man. Yeah, so uh, do a little uh, interim talking later. So, um, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. This is the Patreon part. So, everybody, thanks for watching. If you're watching this on Rewind, you become a Patreon for only 33 cents a day, you fucking cheapskates. It's cheaper than tactical soap, which will turn you into the most alpha, hung like a horse, surrounded by guns man you've ever seen. Carl, where can people find you and your awesome work? Well, they can find me on blacklabellogic.com, Twitter at blacklabellogic. The books are all on Amazon, and I'm on Red Morning with Ryan every Saturday. Ryan, where can people find you? All right, the easy one there is ryanstone.com. Forgive the train noises here. Ryanstone.com, where I do my writing, I do my consultations, and there's always Twitter, Instagram, that's underscore Ryan underscore Stone, as well as the YouTube channel, which is YouTube slash C slash Ryan Stone, all one word. Are you Red Mornings with Carl? We're probably going to start something new. Now that we got Rich Cooper back and Rolo Tomasi in need of a new home, we're going to have some amazing things coming down the pipe. And then as always, when there's anybody who's actually writing on proper intersexual dynamics, I'm doing my best to pop on and say hi whenever I can. So you'll probably see me here too. Nice.
Awesome. And for the people wondering about the audiobook, Gendernomics 1 is now available on Gumroad. You can find it in the description below, and it is pinned on my Twitter. Gendernomics 2 will be done within a couple of weeks, and you can look forward to that on Twitter as well. Everybody, thank you for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe, and we will talk to you soon.